Hi guys, Harbs and Harbs here. Today we're going to be looking at these three, Asmodeus, Mephistopheles, and Zariel, all of whom are archdevils in the Nine Hells and, in Baldur's Gate 3, part of the tiefling character creation process when you select which type of tiefling you'd like to be. So hose yourself down in holy water and prepare to ask Morgan Freeman for forgiveness, because this video is delving into some pretty evil lore. This will not be a totally comprehensive look at every aspect of these three archdevils, but instead will give you an idea of who they are. Okay, let's go! According to the Forgotten Realms campaign setting 3rd edition, tieflings are descendants of fiends like devils, demons, or yugoloths breeding with humans. The ones in Baldur's Gate 3 all have links to devils, and this is in fact the most common association we have with tieflings, but distant links to other fiends do exist in lore. The reason for the heavy association with devils is because of an event caused by a group called the Torral 13, and this is detailed in the Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide. During the Spell Plague, Asmodeus consumed the divine spark of Azuth, and he then worked alongside 13 mortal warlocks that performed a ritual giving all tieflings the blood of Asmodeus, and thereby marking them as his own. Regardless of their true heritage, this change in their blood caused all of them to resemble the features of Asmodeus, and seems like more than anything a way for Wizards of the Coast to simplify the tiefling race, who varied massively before this change. For example, tieflings who originated from the goddess Beshaba originally had antlers instead of horns. The Sword Coast Adventurer's Guide also makes it clear that since Asmodeus' ritual, other tieflings from different infernal bloodlines have been born, hence the mix of bloodlines in Baldur's Gate 3. Like many things after the Spell Plague in the Forgotten Realms, there was a huge reset and simplification, which isn't necessarily a bad thing. So, Asmodeus, who is he? Well, his origin is certainly still up for debate, as it has been changed slash retcon slash left deliberately mysterious on purpose. Some propose that his origins lie in the Pact Primeval, where Asmodeus was a warrior angel that fought the demons on behalf of the gods before encouraging them into signing the Pact Primeval, whereby evil mortal souls would be dealt with directly by Asmodeus. However, the catch that the gods didn't know about was that Asmodeus would in fact directly tempt mortals into performing evil deeds, thereby becoming the devil we all know. The other origin story is that Asmodeus was once an ancient lawful serpent deity that after the forming of the universe with another deity, fell into the Nine Hells after a battle with the other great serpent. The third creation story proposes that Asmodeus was once a soldier for a god now only known as He Who Was. During the Dawn War, Asmodeus' methods were often viewed as brutal, causing many innocent deaths, and so He Who Was banished Asmodeus. He was instead assigned to guarding the imprisoned mad god Tharis Dun. It was during this time that Pazuzu, an ancient Oberith and one of the first demons, built a strong rapport with Asmodeus, encouraging him to take revenge against he who was. Asmodeus therefore descended into the abyss and discovered something called a Shard of Evil. It was this that allowed Asmodeus to create his infamous Ruby Rod, which he used to kill he who was. Before he who was died, Asmodeus was cursed to be trapped in Bartor, the realm of Hell, and the Shard of Evil transformed Asmodeus and his fellows into the first devils. So, the origin stories are really up for debate, but there are similar elements in all of them, particularly the fact that Asmodeus was likely once involved with the gods in some way before his fall, which is anyway similar to real-world Abrahamic religious views of Satan. During the Spell Plague, which was a huge cataclysmic event caused by the assassination of Mistra at the hands of Shar and Sirik, the world of Toril and the Divine Realms were thrown into chaos. It was during this period that Asmodeus, who is the Lord of the Nine Hells and ruler of all other archdevils, absorbed the divine spark of the god Azuth, who was the god of wizardry. After Asmodeus took this divine spark, he became the god of indulgence. When Asmodeus first absorbed Azuth's divine spark, he was initially perceived to be half insane by many of the other denizens of Hell, due to the fact that Azuth, who was still alive within Asmodeus, would sometimes make his presence known through Asmodeus. According to the novel Ashes of the Tyrant, the very nine hells themselves were jeopardized when Azuth and Asmodeus started battling for control of Asmodeus' body. Asmodeus therefore made a deal with Enlil, leader of the Untheric Pantheon, 
to release Azuth and resurrect the dead god Nana Sin, whereby Asmodeus then consumed Nana Sin's divine spark and Azuth returned to godhood separately. So currently Asmodeus remains a god and therefore far more powerful than the other archdevils of the Nine Hells. Asmodeus resides on the ninth layer of hell, Nessus. Specifically, he lives in a place called Malshim, one of the largest cities in the whole of the Outer Plains. It is inhabited by millions of devils who do not partake in the Blood War, but instead, according to Fiendish Codex II, Tyrants of the Nine Hells, they were being saved for the right moment, when Asmodeus would storm the heavens. Although Asmodeus has had challenges to his reign through the Reckoning of Hell, where many of the archdevils tried to overthrow him, his position is solid and even more so now that he has grown in power with the divine spark of Nana Sin. Ultimately, Asmodeus' story and very existence is one of tragedy, and if you want to get really deep and edgy, then you could say that Asmodeus shoulders a cosmic burden, which the gods of the Upper Plains refuse to take part in. The Devil's eternal war with the demons of the Abyss is the only thing stopping the demons from consuming the entire multiverse. Asmodeus knows this and hates the good gods because of it. The Fiendish Codex too has the following to say. In fact, without the Devil's service in this conflict, the Tanari would quickly overwhelm all the Outer Planes and decisively win the cosmic battle for the side of Chaos. After destroying the rest of existence, they would devour each other and that would be the end of things. When his final plans fall into a place, Asmodeus intends to punish his former masters of the celestial sphere for daring to look down upon the foot soldiers who did all the dirty work. Until then, he bides his time while they gaze upon the blood war from their lofty perches. Driven by hate? Check. Evil soul harvester? Check. Plans for eventual domination of the known universe? Check. The only force preventing demons from destroying everything? Um, check. Does that one good outweigh the evil of all devils? Does Asmodeus' cosmic burden justify the terrible evil of the Bartezu? After all, mortal souls are necessary to continue the devil's battle in the Blood War. Let me know down below what you think about this moral conundrum. If the Blood War does ever finish, then ultimately all mortals might be doomed in some way. Asmodeus wishes it to finish in a way of his choosing. According to the Manual of the Plains 4th edition, he wishes to gain the rest of the shards of evil in the abyss which will give him control of the whole of the demonic race. Hey, just out of interest, doesn't the Baldur's Gate 3 logo look a bit like Asmodeus' symbol? Or are they more like Zariel's fortresses on Avernus? Either way, it is probably some hellish reference. Okay, the second archdevil is Mephistopheles. Important to the Hells in many ways, especially the fact that he is second in command and in charge of the eighth layer of Hell, a place called Kinea. I believe that we may have seen Kinea in the Bollers Gate 3 teaser, when the Nautiloid was being chased by the Githyanki. First off, I believe that this is a layer of Hell, given that Shadowheart does say this. I uh, need a companion. Come on! The chase through Hell? The creatures? What they did to us? The tadpole? and the technical chase had stopped by the time they appear on Avernus. I have previously proposed that this area might be the fifth layer of hell, Stygia, which is also an icy layer, but there are some significant differences in the descriptions of the two layers. In Fiendish Codex 2, Kinea is described as follows. The frigid layer of Stygia seems a balmy paradise compared to the icy wasteland known as Kinea. Mile-thick glaciers grind across a forbidding landscape only to crash into Cyclopean mountains. Screaming snowstorms pelt the white expanse of wilderness. Deep crevasses, often hidden by thin layers of snow, wait to devour the unwary traveler. What we see in this trailer seems far more like Kinea than Stygia, which is described as follows. Stygia consists of a dark and frozen sea covered with ice flows. Titanic icebergs jockey for position, casting long shadows across a frosty landscape of eternal twilight. Like a black serpent, the river Styx winds its way through Stygia's salty waters, but maintains its own integrity, meandering across Stygia as it would a flattened landmass. Mephistopheles is the epitome of a devil and plays up to the stereotypical views of devils in the sense that he is described as having crimson skin, massive red leathery wings, curling horns, white eyes and long straight black hair. 
This hellfire look does not match the icy realm that he resides in, but this is no accident, as Mephistopheles has effectively tried to reinvent himself. The first edition Monsters Manual describes Mephistopheles as follows. Mephistopheles is a tall, blue-black humanoid with handsome, if diabolical, features. He has huge muscles, as befits his great strength. His scales are sooty black, his wings are deep blue, as are his horns and talons. His eyes are pale blue, with red irises and pupils. His normal speech is whispering wind. Mephistopheles is a wizard and a fiercely curious one. He spends most of his time studying various projects and although he doesn't have the highest soul quota, he prefers quality over quantity, preferring to make deals with only the best mortal wizards that he can then use to assist him in his experiments. Kinnear is in fact one gigantic laboratory and the devils within work tirelessly for Mephistopheles, striving to discover new things for their master. Through his many experiments, Mephistopheles' proudest achievement was the absolute mastery of Hellfire, which many of the ice devils of his realm did not appreciate. The fact that Mephistopheles is not affected by the cold and yet also has total mastery over Hellfire means any obvious weakness is not apparent, given that the Archdevil has mastered the very thing that could melt and rip down much of his realm. Mephistopheles has been with Asmodeus almost since the beginning, and whilst Osmodius vaguely trusts Mephistopheles to guard the portal into the ninth layer, Mephistopheles wants to rule the Nine Hells in Asmodeus' place. He has even told Asmodeus this openly, but Asmodeus seemingly doesn't think that Mephistopheles will ever achieve this, as Mephistopheles is permanently locked in a conflict with another archdevil known as Balzibul who was currently the Archdevil of the Seventh Layer and in the form of a gigantic slug, having been cursed that way by Asmodeus. The day-to-day -day running of Kinnear was left to Mephistopheles' right hand, called Hut Ijin, a fellow Archdevil that was extremely loyal to Mephistopheles. It was strange for a devil to show no desire to move up the ranks, but apparently Hut Ijin was content in this position to serve Mephistopheles even if he had gained enough power to at least challenge the ruler of Kinnear. Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes does suggest, however, that Hut Ijin's loyalty may in fact be more to do with some kind of hold that Mephistopheles has over him. Interestingly, Hut Ijin is more content to stay in the Nine Hells serving Mephistopheles and rarely wishes to be summoned to the Material Plane to make deals with mortals. In fact, he has sent lesser devils into the Material Plane in an attempt to eradicate the name Hutti Jin from any written record. Those unfortunate enough to summon him are usually killed as soon as he has made a deal with them, providing he can find a loophole to do so. So what is Mephistopheles doing now? Well, one of his goals was to achieve divinity much like his rival and master Asmodeus. This was achieved, sort of, and has to do with Mask, god of thieves and the son of Shah. You know, Shah, the goddess that has something to do with Baldur's Gate 3, but nobody's quite sure what the f it might be. Now, get ready, this next bit is kind of complicated. In 1374 DR, Mask relinquished his divinity to Shah in order to repay an old debt. However, a portion of Mask's divinity, which was stolen by a former chosen of Mask called Kesson Rel, who went insane and began to worship Shah instead of Mask. Anyway, his part of Mask's divinity was absorbed by Erevis Kale, another chosen of Mask and a member of a thieves guild called the Night Knives. The divinity was also absorbed by Drassic Riven, another chosen of Mask and finally Rivalen Tantal, another worshipper of Shah and the spiritual leader of the Shadowvar who were Netherese and venerated Shah. Drassic and Erevis did not like Rivalen and Kesson and wanted to return Mask to divinity. I promise that all of that will be relevant. A man called Magadon, who was Mephistopheles' son upon the material plane, was friends with Drassic and Erevis, and together they fought against the Shah worshipping Netherese. Mephistopheles persuaded Magadon to release his devil heritage, but in order to do that, Magadon needed to go to Kinnear. Mephistopheles persuaded his son, as well as Drassic and Erevis, to come into Kinnear, where Mephistopheles stole part of Magadon's soul. Erevis offered up part of Mask's divinity in exchange for the restoration of Magadon. This killed Erevis. However, Mephistopheles had been tricked and most of Mask's divinity was actually still inside Erevis's body, giving Mephistopheles only a fraction of Mask's divinity. 
Like all corpses on Kinea, they freeze immediately and become encased in ice. However, Erebus's body was affected by Mask's divinity, and Mephistopheles tried much to his frustration to get this divinity for 100 years. But no matter how many thousands of devils and hellfire he threw at the ice encasing Erebus's body, he could not reach the rest of the divinity. After this century, Mephistopheles tracked down Erebus's son, Valen Kale, believing that he might know how to get to the bottom of the ice. Valen was a dedicated god of the ancient deity known as Amenator. That's the god whose temple featured in Baldur's Gate 2. Valen managed to rip Mask's essence from all beings and restore it, with Drassic, who was Erevs' friend, becoming the new reincarnated god, Mask. Kind of. Basically, Mephistopheles absorbed some of Mask's divinity and then just messed the whole thing up. This almighty f up happened in 1484 DR, so pretty close to the time of Baldur's Gate 3. There is some convoluted link in there with Shah and Mask, the majority of which can be found in the Twilight War trilogy and The Godborn by Paul Kemp. Finally, Zariel, Archdevil of Avernus. Once upon a time, Zariel was a Solar, a type of powerful angel that worked at the right hand of powerful divine beings. Zariel used to serve the god Lathander and was tasked with keeping tabs on the Blood War, reporting back to her superiors on any significant changes or developments. According to Morden Kanan's Tomb of Foes, Zariel was frequently frustrated by her superiors not wanting to get involved in the Blood War, and the more she stayed on the lair of Avernus, the more she grew frustrated that she could not join in on the fighting, believing that the Celestials should be combating all evils, devils and demons. Eventually choosing to defy her masters, Zariel trained an army of mortals from the city of Elturel and together they entered Avernus to take on the then ruling archdevil Bel and his forces. However, many of the soldiers of Elturel could not handle the horrors of Avernus and so fled back through a portal to Elturel, trapping their fellow soldiers upon Avernus. The citizens of Elturel were not aware of what had happened upon the plain, and the soldiers who had fled back kept the secret of what happened there, telling nobody of their cowardly retreat. This group of soldiers who had fled were known as the Hellriders and were treated as heroes in Elturel. Down the line, the Hellriders became a group in itself not solely for those who had been to Avernus, and of course we come across one of these in Baldur's Gate 3. So, Zariel was defeated upon Avernus and two of her greatest generals from Elturel that did not abandon her were left with her, Harriman and Alanthius. They were all transported to Nessus, the ninth layer, to speak with Asmodeus, who offered Zariel rulership over Avernus in place of Bel, to which she accepted. Asmodeus was not satisfied with Bel's overly defensive approach in the Blood War, and though he was a master tactician, Asmodeus believed that Zariel would bring a level of ferocity and passion to the fight which Bel could not. Haraman chose to stand by Zariel and was transformed into a Nazagon devil, losing his humanity and denouncing his god Helm. Olanthius did not want to become a devil and instead committed suicide upon Nessus, but this would not free Olanthius and he was raised by Zariel and transformed into an undead death knight forced to serve her as a general once more upon Avernus. Olanthius believed in his final moments that Zariel had turned into something else and that she was less bothered about the greater good and more bothered about her own bloodlust and simple desire to kill as many demons as possible. Zariel has been very present in the Forgotten Realms lore of late and is the primary antagonist of the adventure Descent into Avernus, when after making a deal with the High Overseer of Elturel, drags the city into hell using something called the Companion, which was originally given to the people of Elturel to protect them from undead hordes. In reality, the Companion was always intended by Zariel to drag the city into hell, and the High Overseer knew this. The canon ending of Descent into Avernus is detailed in the comic book Infernal Tides, which according to the associate publisher at IDW, David Hedgecock, is canon. Zariel's plans are thwarted when a companion of Minsk called Crydal tricks Zariel into destroying the contract she had with the High Overseer by um, getting her to hit it with a mace. What's interesting about this comic is that Crydal has made a deal with a servant of Bell, who, as I said before, was the former master of Avernus. Now, Bell is the permanent rival of Zariel, even if he now serves her begrudgingly. After Bell was replaced by Zariel, he made his home in an iron fortress carved out of a volcano, which in Descent into Avernus is described as follows. A gargantuan volcano dominates the horizon. 
clouds of fire and ash spew from its caldera, and the air trembles with its angry rumblings. We can then see that open rivers of lava are channeled through the forge to smelt ore and soften metal. I wonder then if this here is supposed to be part of Bell's forge on the side of the volcano. Bell is desperate to regain Avernus, but many of the devils in hell fear Zariel and so will try to circumvent her rather than go up against her directly. Even Mephistopheles wants to get the river Styx dammed in descent into Avernus, but the adventure states that he is wary of angering Zariel. In fact, it is an emissary Cambion called Rigorath that approaches the group on behalf of Mephistopheles. Given that Zariel has recently lost a great deal of power after her plan to obtain El Torel failed, and that in Infernal Tides we can see an obvious cliffhanger focusing on Crydal's deal with Bell, and that there are references in Descent into Avernus of other devils plotting against her, it could be that when slash if we return to Hell in Baldur's Gate 3, the nature of Avernus could be up for some serious change, and just maybe Raphael as a Cambion may have something to do with it. I mean, he is only a Cambion, and whilst they can be powerful, it is perhaps possible that he is working for an even greater power in the Hells. Okay, thanks for watching guys. This was a relatively complex lore video with a lot of information. There really is lots of information on the Nine Hells dating back decades, and I encourage you to read some of it as it is all pretty interesting. If you'd like to discuss some of the stuff in the video, then do please leave a comment below or join the Discord. The link is in the description below. See you next time. Bye!